Thanks for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and today we are talking with Steve Stoyer, author of Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho Marx's House. Steve, it's a really interesting read, and one of the things that really caught my eye was that you basically wanted to meet Groucho Marx when you were really, really young, right? Yes, I was, I think, the world's biggest Groucho fan, and all I ever really wanted to do was just shake his hand and thank him for all the laughs. And it would be very frustrating when I would hear people say, oh, I was walking in the park the other day and I saw him taking a walk, or, uh, yeah, there's this restaurant he goes to and the waitress said he was there the day before. And it was so frustrating because he was old and had gotten kind of weak, and I thought, I'm never, ever going to be able to shake his hand. And then through sort of an extraordinary set of circumstances, I not only got to shake his hand and thank him for the laughs, but got pulled into being part of his household and ended up working for him the last three years of his life. So it was like, I know my mom used to talk about wanting to take a bath in in hot fudge, uh, as just the ultimate luxurious experience, and for me, immersing myself in Groucho's house was was about the same thing for me. Yeah, and how did that come about for you? Well, there was the Marx Brothers made a movie in 1930 at Paramount called Animal Crackers, and it was for all us Marx Brothers fans the the holy grail missing link in their films because it hadn't been it never been seen on television and hadn't been in theaters even in re-release for nearly 30 years because the rights had expired and reverted back to the writers and composers of the original stage play and universal owned the property but didn't feel there was enough interest in spending the money to clear the rights and strike new prints. So I started a committee and a petition drive when I was a student at UCLA to put pressure on Universal to re-release Animal Crackers. And this led to Groucho coming to UCLA and sitting next to me and we t- and us talking to reporters. And uh, it was just a surreal, it was literally a dream come true because as I say, my obsession with him caused me to literally dream about him, and then I would wake up and get very frustrated that it had just been a dream. So there we were talking to reporters about animal crackers, and I'm like pinching myself that I'm sitting next to him. Then the movie came out, Universal relented and said, oh, okay, fine, here, we'll play it in two theaters and be done with it, and instead it broke the house record at the UA Westwood that had been set by French Connection. And I'll tell you what's really gratifying today is I'll hear from people who say, Animal Crackers was the first Marx Brothers movie I saw, either because they saw it on TCM or at a revival house or something. And I take a a little smidgen of pride that they wouldn't have said that if, if not for my efforts back in 1974. So now it's just a matter of fact, you know, when there's a Marx Brothers festival on TV or at theaters or something, it's it's included, but that was not the case in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And in Raised Eyebrows, you talk uh, a little bit about when you first got to Groucho Marx's house, and and what was that like? That was, uh, it was a real opening the door from Munchkin Land into Oz thing for me because it it was such a culmination of my obsession and I had I had met him and talked to him during the Animal Crackers campaign and then when the the film came out I felt I had served my purpose and that uh the connection would would be severed and so I asked the woman who was in charge of Groucho's life, Aaron Fleming, a controversial figure, if there wasn't something that they needed doing somewhere that I might be useful. And she said, well, we need someone to take care of the fan mail and also to handle 
all of Groucho's to to organize Groucho's memorabilia, um, which was just decades of letters and programs and clippings and photos and scripts and all that going back to vaudeville. And she and they decided that I fit the bill for that remarkable job. And so, yeah, driving into this into this driveway in Beverly Hills and up the marble steps and ringing the bell and going through that, you know, through the looking glass or whatever and going inside this house that was just, it's like, wow, here is where Groucho has lived since the mid-1950s, since you bet your life, and all of the people who have come and gone there and all of the people who would come and go during my tenure there so I was able to very comfortably spend quality time not only with Groucho and also the two brothers who were still alive, Zeppo and Gummo, who lived in Palm Spring, but also George Burns and Bob Hope and Mae West and Steve Allen and Jack Lemon and all these people, the Groucho's old writers and directors would come for lunch and it was very egalitarian. I was able to sit at the lunch table. I was not relegated to eating in the kitchen like the help or something. It was like I was welcome to sit and listen and participate, which I did, which is what led to having enough to say to fill a book. And what amazing synchronicity that, I mean, you really probably were one of the best people to, to have that position, you know, um, just with your interest in him from such an early age. I felt very fortunate and still feel very fortunate because I think when if you if you cross paths with some well-known people early on, it's often the case that years later you think, I wish I had been able to fully appreciate who they were, but I was so young and now I wish I could go back and tell them I appreciate this or ask them questions, but at the time, because I was so obsessed with the Marx Brothers, my brain was like a Rolodex of people's names, and so whenever someone would come to lunch or visit or drop by or whatever, my brain would kind of flip to the Rolodex card and say, ah, okay, that's Nat Perrin. He co-wrote Monkey Business and Duck Soup and has been Groucho's friend since the early 30s, and then he created the Adams Family TV show, and da 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 da. And so, yeah, I was, I guess, uniquely suited uh, to have that job instead of just some person that that was hired and said, I don't know who all these old people are, but the checks go through, so what the heck. I want to hear a little bit about Groucho Marx's uh, early life and. and mm -hmm. Did he know, did he realize when he was younger that this, this would be his calling, uh, that he would become uh, such an entertainer, such a well-loved? Oh, I don't think so. I think he wanted to be a doctor, actually, but, but it wasn't in the cards that he would have had the money to get the training and the schooling. And because his uncle, Al Sheehan, of the vaudeville team of Gallagher and Sheehan, was famous and doing well, uh, Sheehan sort of became an idol of the Marx Brothers and helped get them into show business along with their quintessential sh pushy showbiz mother, Minnie. And so they began as a singing act. I mean, and we're talking like 1905. This is awfully long ago. And, and gradually comedy worked its way into the act. And then he ended up being the most successful of the brothers because his he he didn't really require the others to balance out the humor that he had, and then so he was able to go on and and be the star of You Bet Your Life for about fifteen years, combining radio and television, while Harpo and Chico were sort of stuck in the characters that they had created in the twenties. But uh, he really, he lost his first fortune when the stock market crashed in 29. So he was able to see that even when you think you've made it, it can all be taken away from you in a 
the blink of an eye. But he more than made up for that uh, later in life as his career continued on a good path. But it was just, for me, it was staggering to realize how much, I mean, when I talk about someone who had been in show business since like 1903 or 1905, that he was he was this person from 1890 whose first-hand memories stretched from before the Wright brothers to after the moon landing, which to a history buff like myself was it was mind blowing realizing what he had witnessed, and that's just as a human being from 1890. Never mind the fact that he was friends with. James Thurber and George Gershwin and Irving Berlin and W.C. Fields and all these mythic figures that seem only historical but not three-dimensional and in color. And then, of course, being Groucho Marx himself and realizing what a life and career he's had. Right. That was interesting. I, I noticed that, too, that birth date, uh, the 18, late 1800s. And yeah. it was kind of shocking because I thought of him as someone very modern in a way. Well, he was modern in a lot of ways. He was also Victorian. I mean, he was Victorian literally because in 1890, Queen Victoria still had 11 years left on the throne. Um, And he was always very kind of progressive, liberal, to the point where you bet your life was investigated by the House on American Activities Committee because... During the Red Scare, anyone who had historically left-leaning liberal politics was suspect. And so he was very modern in a lot of ways. He had very old-fashioned ideas about women. I mean, he had three divorces. And as he put it, what did he say? None of my wives had anything upstairs except another man from time to time. So he married them for their beauty and saw them sort of as empty vessels that he could fill with knowledge and education and appreciation for the arts and all that, which is sort of, it's unfair to do that to someone because they weren't necessarily interested in all that, and then they would become frustrated. And I would think, I wonder why I would see some of his other friends who had married well and their wives were both beautiful and intelligent with great personalities, such as Gloria Stewart was married to Arthur Sheikman, who was one of Groucho's old writer friends. And Gloria Stewart was beautiful, but also had a great wit and and personality. Nunnally Johnson, who was one of Groucho's old friends, was one of the big, driving forces, creative forces at 20th Century Fox in the 30s and 40s and wrote the screenplays to Grapes of Wrath and a lot of other great films. He was married to a woman named Doris Bowden, who was also in Grapes of Wrath, and she was beautiful and charming but could also appreciate literary wits and all that. And I would think, I wish Groucho had settled down with someone like that so he could have both the attractive woman on his arm and then someone to talk to, but he seemed to draw that line where it was the men that he would have the brandy and cigars and talk about politics and entertainment and kind of Victorian in his view of women. And so none of his marriages ultimately lasted. I want to ask you a little bit about the You Bet Your Life years. Sure. Did he enjoy those years? I mean, what what was that like? Well, as I say, he had lost his first fortune in the stock market crash after all of those, you know, hard scrabble years in vaudeville and staying at boarding houses and having to put up with just the rough life on the road uh, and then big stars on Broadway and then losing all that money. But when he got You Bet Your Life, he said it was it was the easiest and best paying job he ever had, which was just such a winning combination because all he had to do was go in once a week and 
you know, go over who the contestants were going to be and what was going on and just, you know, light up a cigar and sit in his chair and talk to them. And he got more money than he did back when they were on Broadway or in Hollywood. He said that that, uh, at one point he'd been approached to run for governor of California, which would have been very strange. And he asked what it paid, and they told him, and he said, I make more than that every three weeks doing a quiz show. So he, he, loved, he loved the interaction with the contestants because they were normal people. And he was very good at that, just striking up a conversation and playing off of what they're saying. And so, yeah, he loved You Bet Your Life, and it was, it was easy, and it set him up financially for the rest of his life. So what's not to like? And what were some of the projects that he enjoyed the most? I don't know that there was any... I don't know that there was any period in his professional life that he didn't really enjoy. I mean, that he, either alone or with his brothers, succeeded in vaudeville, Broadway, Hollywood, radio, television, and personal appearances. And he never had to... It's like he never had to, like, play Vegas just to make money or keep money coming in or go back on the road with nightclubs or something like that. He he pretty much did what he wanted to do, and I don't ever remember him wishing that he had steered clear of an entire genre of show business. I think he, he adapted to whatever it was and excelled at it, although I'm not particularly uh, objective about Groucho. Did he talk with you much about if he, if he felt successful? He appreciated uh, the the only time when he could be said to have been at all out of fashion was after You Bet Your Life ended in 1962, and then before the baby boomers embraced him in the late 60s, and then from then on through the 70s to the end of his life in 77, when he was revered as this, you know, icon of anti-establishment you know, countercultural figure, sort of. Uh, so the only time was the mid-60s, and he would do uh, appearances on The Tonight Show or The Dick Cavett Show and just kind of take it easy. It wasn't as though he was forgotten, but he wasn't that hot right then. But then once the uh, college and high school kids rediscovered the films and and sort of, crowned him king, he was able to really see how appreciated and revered and loved he was all over again. And then, he, you know, he did a few one-man shows at Carnegie Hall and some other places towards the end, and it was just, you know, sold out, standing room only, people standing and cheering on their feet. So he knew, you know, it's sad when you think about people like Stan Laurel or Buster Keaton who died, they, they weren't forgotten, but they were not hot, just sort of living in uh, either, you know, apartments or just kind of a small house and quiet semi-retirement. And it was only after they died that the next generation blew the dust off their films and said, wow, this guy, he was a genius, but they didn't get to hear that when they were alive. And Groucho's case, and, and Harpo and Chico died in the early 60s, so they didn't get to ride that wave of of adulation that Groucho was able to do. But he he really appreciated the fact that young people embraced him and the anarchy of the Marx Brothers. So it was gratifying. And also, I felt like I was sort of a representative of all the kids out there who won't get a chance to meet him or say the things that they'd like to say to him. And so sort of on their behalf, I would sort of compliment him. on. But, I mean, even something like signing photographs that he would do, people sent things to be signed and he would sign them. Or if they wrote asking for a picture, he would sign a stack of pictures with his name and I would write the individual's name over that when, as requests came in. And I, I remember leaving his, his bedroom one day and saying, you know, on behalf of all the fans out there who are going to be getting autographed pictures, 
thank you for taking the time to do that. And he just shrugged it off and said, it's part of my job, uh, which a lot of people his age and in his, you know, diminished health would have said, I, they don't need to do that. And they've got, you know, either send them a, a, a rubber stamp thing or throw the letter away or something. But he cared about making the fans happy. And so as a fan, which is all I really started out as, I thanked him on their behalf. And that, that was kind of nice to be able to do that. Yeah, that's really remarkable. Yeah. That's really rare. So, Steve, what what were some of the, the most surprising things for you in your years working with Groucho Marx? I think one of the most surprising and gratifying things was realizing how much of his personality was still there because I had seen him at one of those one-man shows that he did in 1972, and he had had a stroke and was very slowed down and was just kind of shuffling along and reading off of three-by-five cards, and I thought, oh, God, the Groucho that I loved is gone, and this is really sad, and it was like being hit in the chest with a mallet. But then when I got to spend time with him at the lunch table or in his living room or just, you know, in the comfort of his home like that, I began to see how much of the, the guy that I had spent years adoring was really still there, but in the relaxed atmosphere of his house, uh, it was easier for it to come out than with him standing on a stage with a spotlight on him and 10,000 people waiting to hear everything he had to say. But the mechanism that was still, that, that was Groucho was still there, it was just sort of a little out of whack or rusty, but he would, it's like one, one Christmas he got a tin of candied almonds from Fred Allen's widow, Portland. And he went walking past my office at his house and said, send her one of my Christmas cards. And I said, don't you want to say anything personal? And he stopped and he thought, and he said, well, tell her thanks for the nuts. Hope you're the same. And I thought, that's just so charming. Or he he would look forward each day to the mail I brought him, especially the, the Hollywood trade papers, Variety and the Hollywood Reporter, because he even though he wasn't really much of a part of it anymore, he loved to keep track of what was happening in showbiz, just the holdover from the vaudeville days. So he sat down at the lunch table one day and he said, wonderful mail you brought me, nothing but requests for money. And I said, but you got a variety, didn't you? And he said, yes, a variety of requests for money. And it's like he would have phrased it exactly that way in 1932 or 58. So that was still there. So that was a a pleasant surprise. I mean, people have asked me if I was disillusioned to see the toll that age had taken, and I said no. I, I was disillusioned when I saw his one-man show because I thought he was gone. But then I was sort of reillusioned when I got the job and was there every day and realized how much was still there, how much he still cared about politics and current events and his opinions on films and comedy and you know that was it was there it was just slower and softer so it was just an astonishing ride for me at at 20 years of age really sounds like it and steve one of the things that was really touching in the book was groucho's daughter melinda marx wrote to you after raised eyebrows was published and said that you really got it right and i think that's a really good you know great compliment from someone uh celebrity's child some people remember melinda as the little girl that groucho would trot out once a season on you bet your life to do a song and dance or a duet with him or something which she said she never really enjoyed but you know groucho was a doting father and so and you can always you can see him beaming when he when he brings her out but she she basically turned her back on hollywood and didn't really want to be a part of that whole scene so she moved to northern california and was, really wasn't available for interviews and documentaries and whatnot when people would do do things about Groucho or the Marx Brothers. She was sort of a precinct that you, you didn't hear from. And so because we had a mutual friend, Melinda read the initial edition of my book, Raised Eyebrows, 
And I ended up having this just remarkable, lengthy phone call with her where she was, like, choking back tears and saying, thank you for, I, I think the, the the universe is a little more aligned now that you have written that. You wrote the book that I don't, now I don't have to write, and I wish I'd read it sooner. It would have... It would have saved me a lot of money in therapy. And that was it was like, oh, my God, here was just the apple of Groucho's eye and someone, obviously, who knew him well for a long time. And I had written this book where I'm tossing off quite a few opinions about different people and conclusions that I'd drawn. But, you know, which is, I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of audacious for me to sit back and say, well, this guy was a great guy, and this guy was sort of a jerk, and here's what I think is going on here. And for his daughter to say, you got it right, um, was enormously gratifying. You really were very honest in the book. Well, I tried to be. You know, I, I realized that if I wanted to, I could have made up a bunch of stuff, and there would have been very few people in a position to say, I was there, and Steve is completely wrong. But it seemed that to me that if I just told the truth as as best as I remembered it and as fairly as I could without either crucifying some people or deifying other people, it was still an interesting story from which people could draw their own conclusions. I mean, the most clearly the most controversial figure was Aaron Fleming, the woman who insinuated herself in Grouch's life towards the end. And she's a real polarizing figure for fans and for people who knew him because I'm still running into people who say, what a horrible person. He would have been much better off if he'd never met her, blah, blah, blah. And then I run into other people who say, Boy, I hope when I'm his age, I have someone like that. He's so lucky that there was someone that was willing to devote herself. And, and you know, stealing, steal, in the book, I steal a line from, from the French writer André Gide, who said, the color of truth is gray, which is a great philosophy for life, by the way, in, in this polarizing time of politics and whatnot, where it's all either in one direction or the other. And she was she was neither a a saint, a self sacrificing, devoting herself to him in his final years, nor was she evil incarnate. But she she was a tough and mentally unbalanced woman, which is kind of a volatile combination to put her in charge of of uh, an elderly man who's fading out. So I think she extended his life, but made it a much rougher road than it needed to have been. But then his his son Arthur and older daughter Miriam were not interested in taking on the task of looking after him on a day-to-day basis. So it's, it's difficult to just say she was bad or she was wonderful. Um so I tried to be as even-handed as I could, and in fact, people who read raised eyebrows. Many of them say you were too easy on her, and others say, "Why did you say those negative things about her?" So I guess I must have <laughs> struck something of a balance. If they, if half of them think I was too easy, and the other half think I was too severe. Well, hopefully, hopefully they're dishing that out in equal amounts so that it doesn't get confusing, right? No, I'm, I'm fairly content that I did as good a job as I could do recreating these events from all those years ago. I think I think I did as balanced a job as I could without grudges and without soft peddling negative things that I would, you know, I'll leave that out and then it'll make him look better. I didn't do that either. So. Right. You just tried to do an honest account. Right. Steve, we want to thank you so much for uh, joining us today and talking about your years with Groucho Marx. Kind of as a last thing, anything you'd really like the listeners, you think that the, they'd really want to hear about from your days with Groucho? You don't have to be uh, a Marx Brothers fan to appreciate the story, because I've heard from a lot of people who, you know, it was easy for them to put themselves in my shoes and think, 
you know, well, for me, it was Mickey Mantle, or for me, it was Pavarotti or something like that. And I think, what if I not only got to meet them, but got to work for them? So I, I do think it's an interesting story, even if you're not a Marx Brothers fan. And then I've heard from other people who've talked about the degree to which I captured the bittersweet sense of uh, an elderly, like an elderly relative who's fading out and is still there to some degree, and that that delicate dance you have to do because they're sort of unpredictable in their behavior. And so a, a number of people have been touched and said that it reminded them of when their grandfather was dying or different things like that. So, you know, it has different things to offer, and it's, it's out there in... Uh, I did a revised and expanded version a few years ago that with a new afterward chapter that caught people up on events that happened after the initial book came out. And it's on Kindle and audiobook. I did the audiobook and did all the voices on it, which was great fun. So you can give it a read or a listen, as you prefer. It is a wonderful snapshot of Life with Groucho, and I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. It was my pleasure. At Wellness Talk Radio, we'd like to invite you to come check out our website at www.wellnesstalkradio.com. 